I could call down 12 legions of angels. In the Old Testament, one angel killed, I think it was like 28,000 men one night. 12 legions of angels could have wiped out the planet in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. But that wasn't the plan of God. And they laid Jesus in the tomb. What's going on? What's taking place? What did Jesus do? We don't have time to, to flesh all of this out in detail. But what happened? Some people say Jesus went to hell during those days. I personally believe that the Bible teaches that he went to Sheol, which is different. There are some places, the Apostles' Creed, and is a, in some translations, there are some translations that talk about in Psalm 22 how his soul went to hell. And, but the word is Sheol. So let me give you a little bit of background and walk through this a little bit. In the Bible, Sheol in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word for the place of the dead or the realm of the dead. You could, literally, you could literally say, well, we, we rode by Sheol today as we rode by the graveyard. It was a place where the dead went. In the New Testament, in the Greek language, Sheol is translated, the word is Hades. Or the, it's not, not translated, the equivalent is, is Hades. And it means the same thing, the realm of the dead. Hell as you and I think of hell and what the common is what the Bible calls. There's a few places the word hell is used. Jesus, it's used 12 times. The word hell is used 12 times in the New Testament. Jesus used it 11 of those. Mostly in the book, Gospel of Matthew. But the idea of hell is what the book of Revelation calls the lake of fire, which is the last judgment. And all the unbelievers, and Satan and his demons will be cast into the lake of hell to be there forever. So what happened? What took place? You see, you find in the story in Luke 16, Jesus gives a story. It's not a parable. It's a story. Because he uses a man's name. He uses Lazarus' name. He talks about the rich man and Lazarus. How the rich man, when he died, he went to Hades. He went to the side where unbelievers go. Lazarus went to what's called Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. Depends on which translation you have. It too is in Hades. And so in Hades you've got what you would say is two rooms. To use our terminology, it's like two rooms. One where the unrighteous are, one where the righteous are. Before... Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and the ascension into heaven. I'll unpack that in a minute. So what happened? The Bible talks about how that Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And they had a conversation. You remember the story? The man who was in the uh, difficult side, the unbelieving side, was in torment. And he asked if Lazarus would just tip his finger in the water and touch his tongue with a drop of water because he was in such turmoil in tor torment I mean and Jesus said he can't do that because there's a chasm the idea that there's a gulf there's a divide there's a wall there's a barrier that separates the two and nobody from this side can go to that side nobody from this side can go to that side but that's where all the Old Testament people went everyone went to Sheol, or in the New Testament, Hades, when they died. But they were unbelievers. They were on the side of judgment. On They were believers, followers. God, they went to Abraham's bosom, which was a term of endearment and affection. Father Abraham, the, the father of the Jews. And God called him out in Genesis 12. So, what happens? 
Did Jesus go there? Yes. Jesus went there. That's where he went. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, it says, In which he also went, talking about Jesus, and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. A proclamation. There are two words in the New Testament that talk about the idea of preaching or proclaiming and sharing. One is cariso, which is used here, proclamation. The same word would be used of a herald. When a king was coming into a, a town, he had a crier that would go out before him. And behold the king, behold the king, behold the king. It's sort of like when our president walks into uh, for the State of the Union address. All Congress and the judges and everybody are in there, okay? And a guy walks in the door and he yells out. If you've seen that on television, he yells out to everybody in the, in the room, okay? That the President of the United States, and he names their name, whichever president that is, is here. And everybody is to honor. That's the word Caristo. He proclaims this. Uangulion is the word that means good news or that would be the Greek word that would be used to tell about, and it's used often in the New Testament to talk about when Paul and Peter and so forth, Peter and John, shared the good news about Jesus Christ. So it says Jesus went to prison and made a proclamation. He made a statement to the spirits in prison. And again, when the New Testament refers to people, it uses the word soul, the word suke for soul. Spirits, the pneuma, which is used here in the language, refers to every single time in the New Testament, refers to angels or demons, except in the book of Hebrews, where one time the word spirit is used, okay, pneuma, but it's also with the genitive, it says the righteous people. And at one time in the Bible, the word spirits refers to people. In Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 12. So Jesus did go to Hades. He did go to Sheol. And he made a proclamation to the spirits there, to the demons there, that he won. His death purchased salvation, and he was victorious. Now, if you go over to the book of Ephesians, it talks about there that he proclaimed. And the fact that he led captives captive. Okay? But it says there, it talks about his ascension. And so, if you take all of that, and, and I had a lot of stuff here, and yesterday I read it to my wife, and we were like, that's too much to read. You're going to lose people. All right, so I didn't want to read all of this to you. But what happens is, in this, this whole process, Jesus goes down to Hades, where all the lost people are on one side and the saved people in the Old Testament. And even, you remember the thief on the cross? Okay? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, that day, when that thief died, later that afternoon, Jesus died about 3 o'clock. They came and broke the legs of the other two prisoners later that day so they would go ahead and die. Well, don't have time to get into all that, but that hurries up the process. So they did. But Jesus said today, basically, when you die, you're going to be with me in paradise. That word, He didn't say heaven. He said paradise. Jesus knew the word for heaven, okay? Because that man joined him in Hades, on the good side okay and then what happened was 40 days after the death of Jesus Christ or excuse me after the resurrection of Jesus Christ you remember the Bible says he was there with the, his followers and he left earth and he literally floated up you might say our term floated up and he ascended into heaven that's when he took the captives cap and everybody that was on the good side of Hades he carried with him to heaven and so now Paul talks about after the ascension when Paul talks about there's two different places Paul talks about I really want to 
uh, I want to stay here and help y'all, but going to be with Jesus is a whole lot better. And he also says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So where's Jesus now? Jesus is in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. Remember when Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7? Jesus stood up. The only time you have Jesus standing in the presence of God is when Stephen was being stoned. Jesus stood up. Every other time he's sitting at the right hand of God because that's a place of authority. The king sits down. The people do the work. You with me? But when Stephen was stoned for his faith, when he was martyred for his faith, Jesus stood up to honor him. Where was he? At the right hand of the Father in heaven. So did Jesus go to hell? No. Did Jesus go to Hades? Yes. And he led the captives captive to heaven. He carried all of them. So everybody, basically, from the thief on the cross back, in the ascension went with Jesus from Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom somewhere in the earth. The Bible talks about it down in the earth. Okay? And he ascended up. When Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, he was referring to himself. He had a vision from God. He saw God. He was in the third heaven. That's always described as the abode, abode of God where heaven is. There's three levels to heaven. The first heaven we see by day. You walk outside, you see the birds in the, in, you know, outside, you see the clouds. That's the first heaven. The second heaven you see by night where the stars are. The moon is, the sun is. That's the second heaven. The third heaven you see by faith. First one by day, second one by night, third by faith. That's where God dwells. So what was Jesus doing? Jesus was proclaiming, I won. Woo! <laughs> Jesus was triumphant. That's what he did. And so he did that for us. So, on the second day, let's get to the third day. The victory. Jesus' resurrection. Woo! It, just talking about it is exciting. He won and defeated death, hell, and the grave. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, where death is your victory, where death is your sting, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The law is what labels me a sinner and separates me from God. What Jesus did on the cross was the fulfillment of the law so that his righteousness is applied to my life, and I am right before God when I put my faith and my trust in Him. It's a, it's a spiritual transaction. We don't see it. We don't, we don't um, uh, feel it. It just it happens when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So, if you go back in my life, and some of you, you go back in our lives before Christ, you call up, the record you look on our sheet and it says sinner 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 Bob's a thief he stole Steve Dell's matchbox cars but then there was a day when someone shared with me exactly what I'm sharing with you I'm in the sense of the gospel the good news the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again so that I might have life And I put my faith and my trust in Jesus and turned my life over to him. Started following Jesus. Not been perfect. No, not at all. But I've been forgiven all the way. And now I have the righteousness of God. So when you call up my card now, if you go to my account in heaven, you look up Bobby Frank Halstead Jr., pull it up, there's all those sins on that card. <laughs> it goes way on down there. And then right across that whole thing, it says paid in full. In red. <laughs> Woo! 
Why? At the top, under my name, it says righteous. With a capital R. Not because Bob did something right. Not because Bob all of a sudden quit sinning. No. But when I trusted Christ, the Spirit of God wrote righteous across my file because I took on the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus asked. He's asking us, do we believe this? Let me close with this. Jesus gathers, gathers together his disciples. He said, brothers, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas looked at him and said, Lord, we know not where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person comes to the Father but through me, through Jesus. You see, friend, when Jesus rose on that first Easter morning, <laughs> on that first Sunday morning, Mary, Mary, and Salome, and so forth. They went down to prepare his body and so forth, which was customary. They got there, and he wasn't there. And the angel told him, why seek you the living among the dead? The angel was almost like, ladies, what brings y'all here? Why are y'all here? Don't you get it? Jesus is alive. Well, they didn't get it. Jesus had been telling them, but they didn't get it. But that day, Jesus revealed himself to them. And then he revealed himself to the rest of the group. And the Bible says they believed. They didn't know everything. In fact, there were several parts of it. They were wrong before the crucifixion. They misunderstood but they believed him. Why? Because nobody comes back from the dead except God. Everybody dies. There's only two people in the history of the world that hadn't died. Right? Enoch and Elijah. They were walking with God and God called them up. They never died. I had a Bible professor in Bible college said, you want to be famous? Don't die. <laughs> People remember your name, <laughs> you know. But so far, I hadn't figured out how to pull that off. Amen? Every one of us do. But Jesus paid the penalty. And if we'll call on him by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man would boast. You see, if you and I could buy salvation, if we could earn it, if we could be good enough, if we could go to church enough or put enough money in the offering plate or help enough, uh, enough little old ladies across the street or whatever the case may be, then when we got to heaven, we'd strut like a rooster. There won't be no strutting in heaven, will it, Gary? None. None whatsoever. No, when we get to heaven, we're going to give all the glory to Jesus because the only way we got there was because of what he did for us. But we've got to trust him and turn our life over to him. Just because Jesus died doesn't mean everybody automatically goes to heaven. No. 
Jesus said, unless you repent and turn around, you'll all perish. Separated from God. What does that word repent mean? It means turn away, turn around, change of direction. You see, for many of you in this room, you, like me, have already put your faith and trust in Christ. And you know Him in the forgiveness of sins. But there's some of you here today, you haven't done that. You've thought about it. You, you may even say, well, I believe in Jesus. Listen, it's not just a mental sort of assent. Yeah, I believe in Him. No, it's a commitment of your life to Jesus when Jesus reached out to Andrew and Peter and James and John Matthew chapter 8 he said follow me and I'll make you fishers of men we got to follow him somehow we've, we've, we've gotten in our mindset in the American church today we've got in our mind oh I just I prayed Jesus I prayed for I trusted Jesus when I was saved, you know, my Savior when I was 12 years old, when I was 17 years old, when I was 21, or whatever the case may be. I even got baptized. I had a guy one time. I got baptized years ago. Man, it was all I could do not to do what you just did. But he, bless his heart, he was being as honest as he knew how to be. And he thought that was the word, baptized. Lost as a goose in a blizzard. Okay? Now, he didn't know Jesus. Why? Just making a mental assent doesn't mean you know Christ. I believe in Abraham Lincoln. But he ain't changed my life. You know what I'm saying? Hello? Okay? We've got to follow. We've got to commit our life to him. That's what it means to make him Lord is the biblical term. Master is the better term that we would use today. Boss. Jesus, I take all that I am and I'm giving it to you. And I'm going to start following you. Somehow we think I can get saved and I don't really have to follow Jesus. No, it's not an installment plan. We have to jump all in and start following Jesus. And listen, it ain't just for when we die. It starts now. I remember years ago, years ago, I preached, oh, you need to trust Jesus so when you die, you go to heaven. And finally, my son, who was a young, young guy at the time, he said, Daddy, what about now? And he was right. Man, if I don't go to heaven when I die, it's worth knowing Jesus now. Amen? And heaven's just icing on the cake. I told him, I told somebody, I told a group Friday, I preached a funeral. I said, you know what, as, a, as an adult, I trusted Christ when I was 12. Gave my life to him when I was 12. I've never faced anything in life apart from Jesus since I was 12 years old. I've never, I've, I don't know what it is to go alone. The loss of loved ones, the loss of some children, the loss of diff, you know, the, the pain of difficulty and struggles and storms and trials and all that, I've never faced anything alone since I was 12 years old. Because Jesus is with me. I wouldn't trade that for the top ten guys richest in America. Amen? So I want to ask you just a minute. Where are you? Where are you in your life? What is it you need to do? So I want you to think just a minute. Do you know that you know that you know your life is committed to Christ? If you do, praise the Lord. That's exciting. Nothing better. Are you sold out to Jesus? If you're not, He deserves it. Amen? He deserves it all. But you may be here this morning and you've been thinking about Jesus. Maybe you hadn't been thinking about Jesus. But you're at church on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Praise God. Who's Jesus to you? Do you realize that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and you need to call on him? 
to forgive you of your sin and turn your life over to him. Trust him as your Savior. That's what that by faith looks like. You can't see him. You can't touch him. You may not even feel him. But it's a faith transaction. Where you trust Jesus with all of your life and you commit it to him. All that you are. If you need to do that, I want to encourage you to do it. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. You're fixing to be out of here in just a minute. If that's you today, and you know you need to trust Jesus, all you got to do is tell him, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need forgiveness. And you're the only Savior of the world. And I trust you to save me today. I give you my life. However, say it however you want to. Jesus, for all that you did for me, you certainly deserve my all. I'm going to start following you today. You be the boss. I'm going to follow you. Lord Jesus, thank you today. As we get to celebrate, we've talked about the greatest thing on planet Earth. The plan of salvation given to us by the Son of God, the Lord Jesus himself. Thank you for everybody that's here today. Thank you, Lord, that nobody is here by accident. Everybody's here because call them. You care for them. You have a plan. And I thank you for those who already know Jesus. And today they said, yes, I need to sell out. I hadn't been sold out like I should. I thank you for those that are here today, Lord, that didn't know Jesus when they came in the door, but they're going to leave trusting Christ, knowing him as a Savior, committing to him as boss. And I pray for those, Lord, that are still in between. Still got some questions or still unsure about some things. Do a work in their heart and their life as only you can. And for all that you do, we give you the glory and you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look at the screen for just a minute. There's a... There's a slide, turn to the next slide about the uh, decision. There it is. Okay? Same number the welcome is. If you're here today, there's basically four decisions that you can make if you didn't know Jesus when you came in the door. Letter A, I want more information. Preacher, I heard what you said, but I really, I, I want some more. I, I'm not quite ready yet. I want some more information. B, I'm interested, but I really want to talk to somebody about my faith. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to somebody. I got some questions I need answering. I need, I need some help with some things I'm not sure about. Then B is for you. C, today you prayed to receive Christ. You trusted him as your savior. You gave him your life today. C is what you did. And boy, we're excited about that. And then letter D is please continue to pray for me. Just pray for me. I just want you to pray for me. I don't want to talk to anybody right now. Don't need anything right now, but just want you to pray. So I want you to grab your phone, and you're going to text the same number, 470-660-4079. Text the word decision. D-E-C-I-S-I-O-N. Just put in their decision. And you're going to get a prompt back, and it's going to ask you for your name, and it's going to ask you for your email address. Put that in there and send that in. And then it's going to pop up those four options. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose one of those options. Where are you today? Where are you today? 
A represents you, B represents you, C represents you, D represents you. Okay? And all of those texts you send in are going to come to me. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you, whatever you might need. If you just want us to pray, I'm not going to bother you. I'm just going to pray for you. And you'll know that I'm there. But friend, listen. The greatest thing in life is having your sins forgiven and knowing Christ as your Savior and your boss. What do you need to do today? Send in that text, and I certainly appreciate it, okay? Let me mention a couple of things by way of announcement, and then we're excited for what's fixing to happen next. Our ladies' group, we have a workout group that meets at 6.30 on Thursday nights downstairs in the fellowship hall, and so if you want to join a bunch of other ladies who are... Uh, exercising and dancing and whatever else they do. I don't know what they do. The, uh, uh, but get happy and lose calories at the same time, okay? Uh, you come on Thursday night. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is combs and hairbrushes. Thank you for your generosity as we gather those as a church to send the kids uh, this fall for Christmas uh, all over the world. And then our Tuesday morning service uh, is 1030 this Tuesday downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you're available on Tuesday mornings, come. We, we meet, uh, we study God's Word, we eat lunch together. Uh, if you're on Weight Watchers, Tuesday's not for you, okay? You ain't going to lose no weight on Tuesday morning because we eat like kings on Tuesday morning, okay? So join us. We always close out uh, with lunch together. And so uh, we're excited. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about in the fight, the fight for freedom, the fight for your marriage, the fight is spiritual. And so, maybe some other topics as well. You join us as we talk about these things and bring help and hope to you from God's Word, okay? Now, I'm excited to share with you, Ty Arnold is coming, and he has the privilege this morning to baptize his daughter, okay? Amen, amen. <laughs> it was water and cold so it kind of got me off my head. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to read a passage uh, before I baptize my daughter. Um, it's in uh, Acts chapter 8. And in this context, you have uh, the church at its early start. And you have uh, some of the followers of Jesus who he's already ascended to heaven. You have the uh, followers of him Starting here, it says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go out to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water in the Eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. 
Philip as well and the unit uh, when he baptized him. And that's the point I, that's where we are. I want to ask my daughter. All right, here we go. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What an awesome way to end the service. Amen? Amen. Have a happy Easter. You are sent. Amen.